Hi, everybody. How we doing? Good. Welcome to our first second Saturday of 2024. My name is Sam. I'm education coordinator here. I just have some quick announcements before Rick comes on. Um, this is going to be the first of many second Saturdays we have this year. Uh, Rick's always first. <laughs> He's number one, um, isn't he? Right. <laughs> um, Next month, our second Saturday is going to be on February 10th, like that one. This one is also going to be RSVP. Um, that's going to be all about Bill Haley, the Michigan-born rock and roll star, all by our very own Gary Johnson. Where'd he go? Oh, right there. There, he's hiding. Okay. Gary's a, he's on our board of directors. He's the curator for the Michigan Rock and Roll Legends Hall of Fame on our second floor. And he is a walking encyclopedia of Michigan music and music in general. So you won't want to miss that one. Uh, in March, it's actually going to be me, my first second Saturday presentation. <laughs> yes. Um, and I am going to be talking all about uh, Stephen Madai, who was part of a, of a Polish organized crime unit in the South End in the 1910s and 1920s. They stole cars, they killed people, they robbed banks. Yeah, <laughs> real life Grand Theft Auto. Um, what else do we have? We have some educator summits. So if anyone out there is an educator or knows someone that is, these are going to be a free events for any educator in the region or or abroad, really. Um, January 25th and April April 15th from 3 to 5 p.m. Uh, there's no sign up for that. The point of it is just to kind of introduce the museum to educators, show what we have, what we could do, our resources, programs like this, um, et cetera, et cetera. So if you are a K through 12 teacher, a university professor, an after school mentor, if you are a homeschooler, if you are a Cub Scout coach, if you are a soccer coach, educators being used broadly here, we invite you to come. They're free to get to learn all about us. Um, yeah, and uh, we have a lot more going on. You know, our TikTok is itching up on a thousand followers. So thank you for those that follow us. Uh, yeah, even the governor followed us. So I, I guess we're doing something, right? <laughs> That's always cool to see, right? Um, yeah, we're on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, TikTok. Uh, we have a growing oral history program. We have some uh, interviews you can watch on our YouTube right now. Uh, we have some more coming out next week, so if anyone has a story they want to share about their own history in Bay County or something related to it, uh, please reach out to us and we can get you set up with that. Um, I'm not going to waste any more time, so Rick, the floor is yours. Thanks. Thanks, Sam. I'm thrilled to be back, uh, and Bill Haley, I want to see that, that'd be a good one. His song was originally going to be called Rick Around the Clock, but he went with Rock Around the Clock. No, I'm kidding, that's not even, not even real, come on. No, it, it really is, I look forward to this because I know the beginning of the year starts and, and this becomes my entire circuit for the year, and um, back here in Bay City is always my favorite place to start. And this story I've been working on, you might see the article in Michigan History Magazine, it was so much fun to have them share this history, and a lot of people people don't realize that right now we're standing above about a thousand feet below us a 400 million year old ocean so it's incredible to know that I'll teach you a little bit along the way and I want to share a little bit more about the briny depths now of course Native Americans and every wild creature in the woods knew all about the fact that we had these salt springs because that's where all the deer would kind of gather and our Native American friends knew this was the spot to hunt because that they could go up to these areas especially near the Titabawassee River where it was was literally percolating up off the bottom and this salt this mineral resource was something that the animals actually needed so that's where they knew they should hunt so that's where these these briny depths were kind of coming up from uh, but the first people to really explain uh, what uh, you know written down what these were all about were the Jesuit priests that came in and they were telling the whole world about these magical places especially in New York near what is now called Syracuse where they had a lake that was almost like the Great Salt Lake, where all the shores actually had a crust around it. La Lamont, you saw there. This is uh, uh, Peter Charlevoix, so the town of Charlevoix's name for this this uh, priest that came in and actually wrote down. In fact, if you read, how many people know uh, French? Can anybody read it for us? <laughs> Where we go? Blanche du Lait. So the, the the banks, the spring is as rich as and white as milk, and it says the uh, um, the salt is actually heated up. Um, so they knew that the Native Americans would boil this and they could actually break it down into something they could use for preserving meat. So it was a magical mineral that they could put on to create you know, their pemmican and especially the jerky stuff. 
We see really this um, sculpture that's in Syracuse, which was considered Salt USA. It even says it right on their buildings there. But I almost argue that Saginaw Bay City actually had a better title. Um, because in this great relief, you see uh, Simon Lemoyne, one of the father of the priests. He actually has a pinch of salt in his hand in this sculpture. And then you see Garagante, who actually um, is showing them using the process of heating up the water to create this. So now it's no surprise by the 1700s, even before our revolution war that they are making this salt product in Syracuse and this is how they would do it with these massive kettles now imagine these types of buildings being pretty much end-to-end -end all the way to uh, Saginaw from here this is what they would have going where they would fire it up underneath the bottom with fire and then these kettles they would bring in with logs the um, spring water that would come in and that would then go into the kettles and then steam out until finally you evaporate it down till you'd have salt um, they also had, and this is a big deal in Carleton and Zilwaukee, where they would use solar. So they would put all this water, the, the brine solution down, and it's a great idea to use the sun because you don't have to worry about a heating source. Um, in our case, we were brilliant here because of our sawmills. They could use sawdust and all the, the little waste products from there. We had a nearly, you know, at the time, uh, a resource that could last forever. Uh, not quite forever, but <laughs> when they ran out we pretty much lost our salt but here with the sun they were doing these giant pans but what happens when you spend months of having a sunny day and then all of a sudden it starts to rain and reverses that process well everybody in town runs out and throws the shutters on so literally all the townspeople would come in whenever you'd see a storm cloud come and cover up the solar panels as they were making this salt so pretty incredible and again this was as far as you could see in Carleton and Zawaki we had works that were doing a lot of the solar and of course a lot of the townspeople also worked in uh, packing the salt here they are making table salt in five pound bags you see the scoop right above their heads at just enough to scoop in and put in and there is salt everywhere in these buildings which is pretty incredible so yeah that would be the job most of the salt though was, wasn't being transported in these little bags they would move it either in bulk where they would just dump it into a ship which would make cleanup impossible or they would actually put it in barrels where they'd move it so many of the actual um, uh, salt blocks that we see have their own cooperages right next to it where they would make the barrels for it as well so when the Erie Canal came in 1825 and was right next, it went right through Syracuse, the, the first canal, um, this was a perfect way for them now to get this product, which was considered some of the best salt, all the way out to the East Coast. So New York City and Boston were now utilizing this salt from our, our Great Lakes region. And going right through here, it was pretty perfect. In fact, here they are loaded up and look at the barrels on the barges going down here. So pretty incredible, they move it out, but this was just one way of moving it. The, the vast majority of salt on the Great Lakes was being moved by ships. And of course, when we have ships moving salt, we're gonna have ships that disappear hauling salt. And we've got quite a few that are actually on the bottom. The earliest that I can find by doing newspaper searches is 1818 when the Paulina went down. And this is a pretty big gale. This is a melancholy shipwreck they're talking about the independence because they lost all hands during this big storm. And then the Paulina crashed ashore, having a cargo of salt, but um, th basically the crew survived, which was good news for that. The boxer also being lost. This is a quick map that I put together to kind of showcase some of the areas that we actually have these. The big triangles are some of the ones we'll talk about. So around Munising, the one we just found off of uh, Grand Marais as well. And it also points out a couple in 1820. Uh, Zephyr was, uh, had 10 people that were lost, which meant they had uh, company on board. It usually ran a schooner with about six people. So clearly it was probably one of the, the family members that was on board as well. And then the Franklin lost four people and 300 barrels of salt that went down. You'd think after this many <clears throat> losses with salt, we'd actually have salt water in the Great Lakes, but it doesn't seem to measure up from what my math is at all. Um, here we look at the, the very end of the lake here going into Buffalo. So here's Lake Erie coming around the good intent actually tried to pull out here in 1825. They had just the year before saved the crew of the Superior and uh, sadly came back around and everybody perished. Captain Abraham Talbot and the whole crew trying to get back into safety when they realized that it was too big of a storm and they vanished unfortunately uh, with their cargo assault. 
The South America, two with 615 barrels of salt. Eight of their crew were lost on Lake Erie. Uh, Sheldon Bradley was the master, and the, the entire crew they actually listed out, except for one guy, the cook, whose name is not known, which I would say probably 90% of all of the stories I've seen, the cook is never known. <laughs> they never get any good, you know, any good press, sadly. This, out of all my research, this is one of the ones that really surprised me, and it's one of the first steamships that I find that lost a, a majority of their salt. And this is actually the Philip Sheridan, which uh, actually spent mo uh, most of November up in uh, Grand Island, not intentionally. So this, this steamer goes up there, gets stuck by Munising on the island, and they're stuck, and basically they know they have to offload their cargo to get out of there. So in order to get pulled out, you've got to take all that cargo and transfer it to another ship. And the guys on board said, well, we were stuck there and they were only paying us 20 cents a day, but all the Native Americans that lived up there were making 60 cents a day. So it shows you what those guys actually, you know, in the pecking order, they weren't really paid very well. Well, they come all the way back down. They're leaking all the way down here. <clears throat> they go into Buffalo and load salt and 700 barrels of it. And they come back in to come through St. Uh, Clair and all of a sudden they burst into flames. And at that point, they're lucky that they all get into the yawl boat and another boat actually pulls alongside them. The Turner, a steamship, is coming by. And so everybody jumps into that boat. And then the headlines start coming out that uh, this crew was promised they'd get off the boat because it was leaking. They had told the captain, we don't want to be on board. And he goes, well, just hop on board. I'll take you over to the next port. They all get on board. He goes, what are you going to do now? I got my crew. And he starts sailing with them. Well, when you catch on fire, you got to stop. So unfortunately, um, he pulls into Detroit, and now the headlines are coming out that, first of all, Eber Ward, who owns the, Phil uh, the Philip Sheridan, didn't pay them for the shipwreck and was owed money. And, of course, these guys are going bar to bar in Detroit shooting their mouths off about how, you know, Eber Ward, who was a very prominent citizen, um, he wouldn't pay us and it wasn't worth it. And so many bar fights kind of came out of this. And the sad part about the Philip Sheridan is not only do you get a week of bad press for the fire, you get a week of bad press for the supposed captivity that they had not being on board and then all of a sudden they find out that one of the guys went into Rob Roy's and was shooting his mouth off and this guy said well we're gonna beat you up and he hit him one time one punch in the neck and killed him dropped him right where he stood. His name was Peter Wheelahan, and the story goes that Wheelahan had protected one of his other crewmates named Harris, and then all of a sudden, uh, this other guy with a name Pug, his name's Pug Campbell, now, that's a tough name no matter where you live, and uh, Pug was from another ship that had parked in there, and he apparently was a big ruffian that uh, had given a fake name for working on board the steamer that he was on board, and uh, Pug immediately realized uh, it was bad news that he stuck around, so he ran down the street. Now apparently there's a couple, there's at least two weeks of coverage on this. So we know Pug came back according to him and he looked at the, uh, he, he looked at the, the, the guy laying there and the guy, they said, he's dying, you know, his pulse rate. Apparently they hit him so hard that a blood clot went to his brain and that's why he died so suddenly. So he realizes he have to get going. So he starts hopping trains, not buying tickets, but literally like a stowaway, you know, uh, makes it all the way to Buffalo where he's finally arrested and brought back into trial. And of course, you know, this is a big story now how he ran away when he should have at least fessed up and it could have just played it off as a sailor's fight. And unfortunately, uh, th immediately the jury found him guilty. So he gets 10 years. Our Jackson prison had just opened up. So he's one of the first customers to go there and spends a couple years in there when finally in 1880, our governor says, yeah, he's been in there long enough. And the one thing he goes, you promise not to live in Michigan? The guy goes, oh yeah, I'm out of here. <laughs> Boom gone. And I swear to you, I've searched and searched through genealogy, through newspapers. I can't find Plug Campbell anywhere. So this guy vanished pretty well and uh, pretty much off the, the story. But uh, yeah, that's the story of Plug Campbell and the Sheridan, which was pulled out and rebuilt. They actually managed to sail her again, too. This is a, the tough part about doing the research on these is that not always are they spelt correctly. And, and one of the ones that was actually lost off on Mohawk Island right up here, uh, loaded with 500 barrels in 1869, it, its original name is actually the Allen, but it was also printed as the Alfred Allen. So, you know, I'm whining here a little bit because all I have to do is type it in. What, you know how I used to do my research? Every newspaper, every microfiche flashing through the comics looking for a story. It took for 
forever to do it and you couldn't do it in the comfort of your own home and now I just type in the name of the ship and it starts spitting out all of these details and all I have to do is go and try to build the story from it. But this is where you see a lot of difference between Allen and Ellen, which it is actually Allen that was lost there and I believe it's still up here. I, I have no record of it actually being pulled off of the beach. Um, I got to spend some great time, and my wife too, at Port Colburn. Um, we got to spend, twist my arm, two weeks on a cruise ship. How much fun is that? And, and also, why would they ask the shipwreck guy to come along and, and be <laughs> on board the boat? But it is the gr very greatest thing ever, and uh, I just got booked for two more weeks. So we'll do two weeks again starting in September. It's a fantastic tour. Uh, my little granddaughters came on board and actually had caviar. This is how spoiled these little girls are. Oh, Oh yeah, so we can't wait. But Port Colburn is where we come through to go through the canal to go around Niagara Falls. So one of the stops is at Niagara Falls. We literally hopped on buses here and the boat went through the locks and we just went around and checked out the falls, went underneath them, went on top, went, I mean it was all over the place up there. So great, great, great tour of Port Colburn. So Syracuse is right here. Here's Lake Ontario, Lake Erie going in St. Clair and all the way up into Lake uh, Huron. And this is that underground ocean, how big it is. So it didn't take long, I mean this is really on the border, it didn't take long for them to figure out that there were salt deposits all around Michigan. And as soon as Michigan became a state, we were dead broke. There's no money and our governor's like, you know what we need to do? We gotta figure out what Michigan is. All of these resources, they knew about the copper. They knew about, in fact, after doing the borderline, Ben Franklin is the one that thought there was more copper and there was a lot on Isle Royal, but that's the whole reason we have Isle Royal so high up. It should really be part of Minnesota and almost on Ontario, but it's part of Michigan because of the state line that was drawn. So here the, the governor says, you know what, we need a guy, we're going to hire our first geologist and he'll go around and actually check out and see what we have. Copper, iron ore, uh, plaster, especially going into uh, the salt that they'd heard about, um, especially on the Titabawassee River. So here he comes, Douglas Houghton and his wonder dog Mimi right here. And their job is to go up and explore all these areas. But remember this, we're talking about 1837. There's not railroad tracks, there's not highways, there's definitely not helicopters. So his whole job is to either take schooners up and he mapped this entire area, beautiful maps up here where he got eaten by mosquitoes at Tawas. Uh, the, the, the diaries that he has are the best part about it. You can find these online and read about him going in. So he literally goes, from Royal Oak, takes a stagecoach to Byron, and then he goes all the way up the river. And I thought, man, that's a neat route, but maybe I should take it first, right? So let's check this out. Houghton actually started in Royal Oak and took a carriage ride until he got to Byron, Michigan, where he got a canoe and started to ascend the Shiawassee River all the way through three different counties to go into Saginaw County. And of course it was on September 25th that an equinoctial storm, as he described it, hit the area. Six days of pouring rain and he wanted to try to measure a salt spring in that flooding. When Houghton traveled up to the Salt River, he just came just short of where we're at right now. And after six days of rain, his plan was to build an earthen dam around the spring, which appeared to be bluish in color, according to his notes. He would build up an earthen dam around them so he could take measurements of what the salinity was coming up from these deep underground wells. And to his surprise, the percentage was even better than that was found in Syracuse. So the numbers came up at 90% salt water. So this is going to make it a lot easier and a lot better salt. In fact, our salt coming out of the Saginaw River area was going to rival the stuff coming out of Great Britain. The problem with British salt coming over is they would use it for ballast in the ship. So they wouldn't charge them anything to bring it to the United States. They just throw it in the bottom of the ship to make sure it stays upright. So literally they didn't have a big, you know, uh, overhead on that cost. But when we came in to start building it, these different um, salt brine wells that would go down 800 to 1,000 feet down and then bring up uh, through pumps, bring that salt water up, 
we would boil it down and use the tailings from the sawmills. So they had an almost inexhaustible saw, uh, source, but unfortunately, as we know, all the trees were eventually cut. Eventually we started going over to get our trees, especially for our mills here in Georgian Bay in Canada. And the Canadians got smart on that. They're like, well, we want them to cut trees here, not in Bay City. So they raised their tariffs so high it wasn't worth it. They were taking two miles of trees and dumping them in the lake and chaining them together and then using tugboats to tow them to the river here. You can actually see, look at their logs all here. You can see that was part of the industry, but unfortunately it didn't last much longer after that um, because pretty soon it was all being done in Canada. Canada. Well, the good news is we did have a big salt market that came out here, but 20 years passed since uh, the geologist Houghton came up with these numbers. He said, look at this is great. And so the state goes, well, why isn't anybody jumping on this? And they said, well, we have to give them an incentive. We'll give them a bounty on every pound of salt that's made. And the way that this came out was a compromise because right away we had good state legislatures for Grand Rapids who said, we've got salt here too. So we're gonna try to dig it on the Grand River. And all of our legislators went foul, no, not gonna happen here. You're gonna do a bounty so that whoever gets the cargo in first wins. So here we have 10 cents per bushel. And they came out with, uh, we'll just go ahead and, and pay this out for whatever bushels you do. And of course, immediately, immediately, East Saginaw started cranking out so much that it broke the treasury. We had to sue Michigan to get the money because they, they made so much. It was a bad deal. Well, great deal for anybody in, in Saginaw because they literally were paying for the production of their own you know, salt as they came out. This, each salt, this is right pretty close to gray iron. So if you go down gray iron, it would actually be right about here. This is a, a big, huge boom area that's now filled in. There's a couple of areas that I'll show you here. Uh, Jesse Hoyt, the name you know from Saginaw, um, owned all this property. He also built ships right here and launched them. The Quick Step, the Starlight, the Bark, Jesse Hoyt, all those were being used now to haul salt. So we had a readily built fleet. We had plants cranking out salt and immediately became the world leader in, in salt from the numbers that were coming out. And this is a typical operation. This one's actually, um, if you know where Pothoff Park is, it, it'd be right across um, it, where the Holland Street Bridge crosses in Saginaw. So not far from City Hall. This would be the giant blocks right here. Then you'd have this dock that I don't think I'd be standing on. I can't believe they're fishing right there. Doesn't look too safe at all. Uh, but this is typical. This would be Buffalo Salt that was building. This is uh, the Plenty Mills and the Salt Works. So here's your Salt Works here and your Plenty Mills. And you actually have this one is... Um, this is a little bit further down and it'd be across the river from, um, you'd almost have to go past, uh, almost across the street from Buffalo because this would be down um, where the Holland Street Bridge crosses as well. So right down the entire uh, river system, you saw these massive areas to load up the wood, put it on there, and then of course all the little pieces and parts were going inside to boil to make it come down. Now to go to Bay City, this is a cool map. This is 1867, a bird's eye view. Um, it shows you a couple of things. Bay City's first salt plant was right here at Bay City Salt. And this is also where we started making the, the underground pipes, the wooden pipe system uh, that H.B. Smith actually uh, perfected here um, and his big company that uh, was making them there. This is a neat too. If you blow it up, you can actually see it's the, ste the uh, side wheel steamer Saginaw, which um, didn't spend a lot of time here, but definitely did a lot of routes to the upper peninsula and did a lot of traveling um, into Lake Erie, where's most of its route. You see uh, N.B. Bradley, too, which was another big producer of salt, and of course, Henry Sage. So here's the Third Street Bridge. The uh, peanut place would be right about there. So this is the first bridge to cross in here, and this whole area was an area that uh, Sage wanted to call Lake City, but it never really cut out, caught, uh, caught on. Look at the tailing areas. This, used, this was carved out then to become Davidson Shipyard, and now the, the uh, softball fields and uh, volleyball courts and such are there. Also, look at this. Middle, the uh, middle grounds are actually cut in half. Sage came through and cut a channel through there so we could get easier access. So there was actually an area that they could get to the sawmills from here. So the middle grounds are an um, area where we had salt. We also had lots of wood operations there as well. So cool map. I like looking at these older maps. This the neat one too. Was there a question? I'm sorry. Nope, okay. This is a great map showing you going just north, and it kind of go all, it does go all the way down the literally to where the uh, Titabawassee feeds in and the uh, other rivers. And you go up here to Bay City, and you're seeing a whole bunch. All these little derricks here are kind of the salt uh, locations, 
and you see how it filled up very quickly up here. And you see typical operation right here of the McGraw mill in the salt. If we go down to where Crow Island is, so every time you jump on the Zawaki Bridge, you're crossing Crow Island, which used to be a passage that went um, around here, and they dug it out for Oneida. And what's unique is who was involved in doing this project. Um, I didn't even know this was out, but this was a, uh, on eBay for a signature, and they didn't even care that it was H.C. Potter, which if you know Potter Street Station, the train station, you know, you know that's Henry, not Harry Potter. Harry Potter is a <laughs> totally different magic boy. Uh, <laughs> Henry Potter being the big in the, in the railroad industry, and of course one of the early pioneers for being one of the managers at, at East Saginaw. But he went into partnership with Butterfield and the Fargo Brothers, so here's the guys that that not only formed American Express two years earlier, but now they're dealing with the Saginaw River to actually create salt products here. And they dug out a beautiful channel that came right around here, and this would be the lumber yard. This is, again, gray iron would be down here. This area now is Wirt Stone, where it's all filled in, and they haul in rock and such. Um, and this area has changed a lot over the years. Let's take a look at, here's the channel dug out. Here's the new lumber dock coming in. We see this actually start to get built up on the opposite side as well as Zawaki builds bigger in the town of Melbourne, which is now gone, was another area that was very heavily into uh, salt and, and wood. And the headlines change as Behringer takes over the, the Oneida mill and you know his building right across from TV5. And Oneida Salt starts getting so big that they actually get the interest of another guy named Ralph Loveland who buys the island and builds all of this lumber and salt right here. The island itself he tried to turn into a farming, um, a huge island of just farming with the rich soil that was coming in. Of course, I wouldn't grow anything there now because that's where they were dumping a lot of the dredgings from the river. In this area, they always had sandbars that came across here and there was always a fight to try to get the government to come in and clean it out so they could get their ships in here to be able to load up and Loveland was one of the last ones to have a company there. Loading in Bay City, this ship right here, the Muir, actually took out in 1893, uh, massive cargo, 4,200 barrels. So it's packed to the gills with salt and crashes in uh, Lake Michigan and goes down. Uh, we see the, the uh, Melrose too, with 3,000 barrels coming out of Bay City, which was lost near Sheboygan. That one was just recently found too, just pieces. The Miztech, I always like the shipwreck. I think this is the closest you'll get to Mixter on a shipwreck. M-I-Z-T-E-C. And the Miztech, um, very long line of being bought out by Omer Blodgett, who had a fleet here in Bay City. And this, this picture, when you dive the Miztech, it's so shallow and broken up, it's not really interesting. So what um, divers are doing now is they're going down and taking thousands of photographs, and then they're stitching them together into a 3D model so we can actually surf around this wreck. Zoom around, okay, oh, I wanna see the stern a little bit more, and look at the knees. This is where the deck is actually affixed to the side, so it's splayed open, and oh, there's a boiler. So we go over the top of the back deck, and the incredible, look at the rust and the rivets that are actually in this boiler, which is probably a Saginaw boiler. And you can actually see that because that's an actual photograph that is stitched in. So if you go to shipwreck.org, uh, 3dshipwreck.org, you'll find um, almost 20 or 30 of these shipwrecks now that these guys and gals have done, um, going down and doing this all for free just to build a database of shipwrecks. And nobody is more thrilled than Rick because I, I love scuba diving, but I love being able to show you the way that they're laid out now in this way. The Mingo is a wreck we haven't found. This was also part of the Blodgett fleet. He lost 12 ships in 20 years, and I don't know how he stayed in business. It was just shipwreck after shipwreck. Um, when we saw the Miztech go down, it was being towed by the Zilla. He lost the Zilla. Luckily, he had sold it, and sadly for the new owner, it went down, and there's a, a horrible, I mean, sad picture of it sinking off a whitefish, and it's in deep water there. Mingo was also broken off, but the crew got off the boat. It went down with its load of salt in uh, 1928, so one of the more recent of the, the shipwrecks. This is up by the... Um, if you think of the islands off of Lance, Michigan, so just before you get to the Keweenaw, so you're going into the, not the Apostles, the uh, um, Huron Island and the, the chain that's up there, which are now bird sanctuaries, this is the area that the Mingo would actually be in. This is a, a, a family of Eddies that were here. There's actually some in Saginaw. There's another cousin that was here. Eddie Brothers had a son, and Ned 
He went, was the first in the family to go to Harvard, and he met a, a buddy of his named uh, uh, Ned Skinner, and they decided to go into business. And they said, this salt business is smart. And they said, but we don't know about the burning the wood. They kind of saw the writing on the wall. So they said, we're going to build a plant. Not here. We think we can hit um, better, be closer to Chicago if we go to Ludington, and we'll probably get better salt there. So they started taking uh, soil samples and, and brine samples and realized that if you go down to Pear Marquette Lake and go to this area right here is the first place that they built up Anchor Salt. So this became a major complex there and it's still in operation today as a matter of fact. And one of the vessels that was actually coming out with a load of Anchor Salt left out of um, Manistee, pulls out, or out of Ludington, pulls out, makes a left-hand turn and according to this guy, the sole survivor of this ship, he said the captain, the mate, and the cook all started drinking and said they were sauced by the time they got into a big storm in Muskegon and the ship sank right there. And so he's the only guy from the Waukesha that actually survives. It's incredible to have a picture of him. Um, I'm very excited to have Frank Dulock, you know, right here in front of you to see. Uh, everybody said, hey, we know that captain. He would never, ever, ever drink and we don't believe you. And there's a battle of headlines for a while. And then one of the other headlines said a giant whiskey bottle washed ashore in the wreckage. So now I don't know if it's just a newspaper making, you know, making it up, but this is part of the story as it goes. So Frank's story might have paid true. I went up to South Fox Island um, in uh, Northern Lake, uh, Michigan, and I was talking and I said, what's with the shipwreck out there? They said, it wasn't here last year. And the pieces of the James Platt had washed in while we, you know, over the, the winter time, um, about two and a half years ago is when I was out there. So to see that the James Platt is pretty cool because this was loaded with a, a bunch of Bay City salt that was trying to go to market. Uh, the tragedy is that it, it crashed right next to where the boathouse is for the, um, lighthouse keeper so they must have seen the ship come in they tried to lend their help and sadly the captain and the cook both drowned trying to get off this boat even though they were right there where safety was close on the island there's actually a little grave marker that um, we don't know who it is but it does have a DAR or one of the daughters of the revolution had a little part on there so we're thinking that maybe this is the captain if he was a member of, the, of that group uh, we just don't know for sure if that's his gravesite or not um, the 1909 storm is, brings us up to the current time of one of the most recent discoveries that we've made on Lake uh, Superior. This is a massive storm that came out and imagine to yourself, you're sailing along on the Ann Arbor car ferry and you see a boat just kind of bobbing there. It's not at anchor and you, you try to hail it and they're not under power. They're just kind of floundering a little bit. So they go alongside it and they put a yawl boat, they crawl on board. The dinner is still on the table, but there's not a person on board the ship. The Batavia is completely a ghost ship just floating there. Now, for a week in the newspaper, they were like, what happened? You know, obviously it was Bermuda Triangle. I mean, the, the only thing I can think is that they vanished in some kind of a secret vortex. But uh, within a week, we find out that the Batavia's crew got into a lifeboat. They thought they were sinking, and obviously it wasn't as bad as they thought. And so they left their dinner on the table and ended up, you know, the Ann Arbor grabbed the ship and brought it back in, which is usually not cool for the captain's record either. If somebody else brings your boat back, uh, <laughs> not all always the best, but um, the Batavia was just part of that. So this is a storm system that's hitting all of the lakes and we see the Nestor which crashed ashore very close to where the Mingo was. So um, the lighthouse keeper at, Big, at Huron Island is looking at this boat come in and it's loaded full of guys and unfortunately it's breaking up on the rocks but it's 40 feet below him and he's trying to get a rope to get him down and all of a sudden a piece of shipwreck flips up and hits him from 40 feet down and crushes his shoulder, dislocates his shoulder. So this keeper is out of commission and the boat breaks up and there's, a co there's literally a life-saving uh, team that's on the other side of the island. They've been hiding but they, you know, there's no radio. They couldn't call in to know that the, the, the nester was breaking apart. So unfortunately everybody drowned on that wreck which is just tragic. Another amazing rescue happened happened in, in um, Whitefish Point. It turns out that in the springtime in May, you're seeing all kinds of ice flows and they all kind of come to the east side as the lake is draining out and it clogs it up. And these ships often get caught in there and they had at least 15 ships that were stuck. But the Urania was getting pinched, a wooden ship between 
two ice floes and it just finally poked through the side and the captain's like, what am I going to do? So he loads everybody into two lifeboats. They start jumping onto the ice and then they'd, whenever they'd hit open water, they'd jump into the lifeboats and they'd float until they got two miles to another boat. They could see the boat, you know, not far from them. So they just kept and self-rescued themselves and the Urania folded up and went right to the bottom off Parisian Island, in which uh, the um, Shipwreck Society found in the 70s. And supposedly there's footage that was uh, actually done in 1989. I'm a board member and I can't find the footage. It's killing me because we've got all, we found 14 new shipwrecks up there. I can't convince them to bring the robot down over to this one, which is below. It's at least 170 feet deep, so it's deeper than I can go. So I need the robot to do it. Plus, I'm kind of, you know, I'm an old man now, so I can't go do this Lake Superior stuff anymore. <laughs> so here, here's the big storm that's coming up, and we've got these big headlines of the guys from the Urania being saved, the sad losses of the Nestor being crushed, the Batavia floating by itself. And this storm comes up and hits into Lake Michigan and pushes north. So this is on April 30th. Now we're zooming up into Whitefish Point where the low is now crashing these giant winds that are coming up. So we've got gale force winds and it's hitting this poor salt carrying vessel called the Adela Shores. And for a week, nobody even knows it's missing. So they're reading all these headlines and then all of a sudden you see headlines that say, has anybody seen the Adela Shores? Where did it go? And it completely vanished. Everybody was gone. There's hardly anything written about it because only a couple of the crew members were found. And this is what she looked like, a very typical freighter, and this was a bulk carrier, so they would open the hatches and just pour salt into it in Ludington, and then they would carry it up to uh, what was Morton salt uh, in, in Superior, Wisconsin. So here's the route that they're making. They get all the way through the ice. We don't know if it's crushed by the ice. We don't know if it's sunk by the storm. We just know that it's gone and that a lot of the, the wreckage of a beige-colored cabin was found from the back. The pilot house was found crushed and even strange um, the, the wreck actually has name boards that came ashore to say, look at on the Adela Shores. So who's Adela Shores? Well, it turns out that this is Adela right here. And that's the daughter of Eugene A. Shores, who lived in Manistee, Michigan. But sadly, when we had the big wildfires that burned down the towns, he was an insurance agent, lost not only his house, but his shirt in the insurance business. And he thought, well, you know what? There's a lot of stuff happening up in Ashland, Wisconsin, which is really close to the East End. You know, as you get towards the Apostle Islands, this is where Ashland is. And he said, I think this is ripe for a sawmill, but they didn't have one up there. So he bought Muskegon Sawmill and he tore it apart in four days and had 80 people bring it all the way up to Wisconsin and rebuilt the entire sawmill and he had the biggest dock on Lake Superior. Look at the size of this thing. He's got lathe piles here and then wood piles here and all of his sawmill operations are right here. And here's a picture of the Adela Shores. This poor boat, when it was launched, it was, it was supposed to be called the, um, oh, what was the name of it? Something State. Um, I can't remember now, but it was never launched for that name. They, they decided they didn't want the boat. So this guy says, I need a new steamship, Eugene Shores. I want to name it after my daughter. So they paint her name on it and it gets hung up when it goes down the ways. So it doesn't launch correctly. It breaks off part of the stern when it goes in. Um, there's also some hoodoo. That means there's something bad. Um, hoodoo in the fact that they didn't use uh, alcohol to launch the ship. They use lake water to do it. And so everybody's like, oh, Oh man, it can't be good. And of course, she goes out for her first load and Jay Carr takes it all the way down from Ashland at these docks, a million board feet on his first load. I mean, come on, let's break it in, you know. It brings it in and it's leaking so badly that they hit a storm on Lake Superior and they dump 75,000 square feet of lumber into the lake. So they come back and they sue the shipping company. They're like, listen, you sold us a bummer. Uh, we need 28 thousand dollars to repair this and it goes through trial after trial and I think they win but I can't find it I've got to go back and actually go through um, Cleveland where it was built to find out exactly what the settlement was but the truth is she hauled a lot of a million uh, board feet out of here and had a good life she also ran on Skilligalee Reef which is out in, um, closer to the Mackinac Straits area if you look on the Michigan side there's actually a little light that's there where they ran aground so she had her own bumps 
with history until the, the very last one here, which was pretty sad because the wreckage starts coming ashore. The newspapers are really kind of um, hit or miss on any information. So my thought was, well, why don't I go to Chicago? It turns out my queen has a, a conference in Chicago and she goes, well, I'm gonna be there for a week if you wanna go. And I said, well, National Archives is there. I might as well go because they have every log book for all of the life-saving stations, all the log books for all of the lighthouses in Chicago. Now it's an hour to get there because I take a bus for what, 40 minutes, and then I take the train system too, which of course Rick, being from the UP, got lost on the trains yeah. in Chicago. But I finally made it to the archives and they couldn't have been more helpful because they started pulling all these books and I had to check four life-saving stations on the coast. So um, the shipwreck coast as we know it starts at Grand Marais, Michigan, where there's a station and runs all the way through Deer Park, Muskellunge Lake, and it goes into Whitefish Point where we eventually got a Coast Guard station. So I had to read all those books, twist my arm. I had a week, so <laughs> I did it. And this is what I found. It was never in the newspaper, but it says Surfman Fuller came in and found a piece, P-E-A-C, -P -E piece of board with the following writing on it. And it says, there are nine of us on a life raft, we're abreast of, and then it stops. They don't say where they're at, which is like the ultimate in cliffhangers. And then of course, sadly, nobody made it back. And it says the signboard um, also came ashore of, of the Adela Shores. So literally a message from beyond, which as you know, I wrote a book called uh, Messages in a Bottle or uh, Bottle of Goodbyes. And literally this one I didn't even know about because I had never seen this actual McGraw writing the, uh, the story here. Another relic that came in that I didn't find in the books, and this makes it very suspect for Rick, is that if you get a newspaper story that says that a raft comes in and it shows a jacket and an oar that says Adela Shores, and in the pocket of the jacket is one of the mate's um, cards, union cards. So it says his name on there. They know it's Pete Olson. He's from West Isles, Wisconsin. He was part of the crew. But how true is this? Did he try to make a life raft out of a piece of the deck house and try to bring it ashore and was lost? We don't know. It, it, it's not in any of the log books, so why wouldn't somebody, if they found this, anywhere between, um, and it was said it was picked up off of Grand Island, that might throw it a little bit, that a fish boat from Grand Island brought it directly to Marquette. That probably fares into why we don't see it in the log book, but it just throws a lot of mystery into how authentic it is. And as you know, if you've read my book about 70% of those notes in a bottle are all fake people would write them and just say well I wonder if this will get printed and of course you know these people will print it <laughs> yeah there's no question they'll print it yeah I noticed on that last newspaper clipping if we can go back real quick mm -hmm. they refer to it as being washed away by the sea finally by the sea at the end when did the vernacular of Great Lakes come into play versus sea? They still say sea. In fact, we see that almost interchangeably, that they'll say sea. Um, we, in fact, it, yeah, almost all of it is something that I think the newspapers are just, and even in the log books when the guys write, many of them come to the Great Lakes from the ocean too. Most of our life-saving station people were, were local folks, and they'll put lake, but you do see that a lot. But the oceans, I think, is where you see it. You also see these newspapers all the Great Lakes newspapers are very hard to find, but I can find all these stories in Nebraska. For some reason, they all hung on to their newspapers, so a lot of them will be reprinted with that. But isn't Lake Superior designated as a sea? They call it our greatest inland sea, so I, I agree, yeah, but typically we would say it would need salt water, which I guess if the shores is down and it's got salt in it, I think maybe it kind of counts at that point. So. Every summer, and especially since I, I was laid off from PBS, I, I, I've got time on my hands and the, the Whitefish Point guys say, we need somebody to come and eat our licorice, which I'm more than happy to do. So I'll get on board the boat and my job is to tie the boat and to make sure that, you know, if there's any history questions, I can help a little bit on that. But really, it's pulling in 800 feet of cable because anything we put down there, whether it be a hook, an anchor, or a robot, all has to be brought back up by hand. We don't have a capstan or anyone way to, to do it so they want me to come out there and do it and quite honestly after all these Christmas cookies I could really use the exercise so I, I go up there eat their licorice and get on board the boat and sure enough um, Daryl has hooked into a shipwreck and he goes 
I don't know what it is. Will you come up here? Um, it looks like it's a steamship because we saw what looked like the Adela Shores stack. The length we can measure within a couple of feet so we get a good idea of how many steamships are up there. And here's Daryl flying the robot down 600 feet now and he's flying towards the stern section of the ship. Watch this monitor right here. So we're going around the back. This one is showing us so we're not tangled. This is our sonar forward. You can see just part of the ship so we don't run the robot into something. Visibility is pretty good. We automatically know we're on the stern. You see it coming up where the rudder is coming down. What would be great is if she isn't buried, like the Hurington we just found is buried up past the propeller. We couldn't see it. This one has a little bit harder bottom. As we come down, He's flying it by joystick. Daryl's an incredible pilot. They won't let me fly the robot anyways, which is probably smart. It's about $570,000. So he comes down and look at as we go forward or back towards the aft. Our hope was to find a name here. We got lucky and we found the Bay City built um, Atlanta and it had the name in gold inlay print on it. Uh, when we found the Curtis for National Geographic when they were on board, it said um, a Marvin on the barge we found instantly know what it is. But here, look at that. Got a nice old propeller. It's partly buried into the sand. We can look too for damage around the bottom because we're seeing the majority of it looking for ice to see if it pinched it because it might have been an ice sinking but this looks like storm damage as we're going along and looking at the different pieces. This is, um, they want to relate, in fact, pretend like you didn't hear Adela Shores because the museum really wants to release this in May. So act really surprised when you see it. Go, really? Rick didn't talk about that. <laughs> yeah. Um, you'd mentioned that there might still might be ice on the propeller. Would that have been? Oh, no, not ice, but damage that would show us. that. Would, yeah, yeah, that would be amazing at that depth. But you know, yeah, for us, that would be incredible. But every little piece of debris we find is important to that. So do you mean ice like the ship was in port and the ice was around it or like an ice jam? It would be an ice jam that would squeeze it and this wooden vessel would pop the seams on it and we would see where it was crushed. So many times like when we found the Hurington, we go around the backside and there's no name and we're like, well, what happened? Well, I know the Hurington got run into by the Cetus. I said, if we go four more feet forward to the back hatch and see a dent and there's a big dent. So those are all of our details that we pick up. On this, we would see the crushed, like the Eber Ward was crushed by ice when it went down. We could see how it actually went down, but we didn't see anything. This is a picture of uh, one of Blodgett's other boats that went down again from the Bay City area. Omer Blodgett had an entire fleet. This is the Herman Hetler. And this drawing was done by Ed Pusick, who was a fantastic, if you've read any of Fred Stonehouse's books, he would knew about Pusick right away because this guy could do waves like nobody. Um, I was so lucky to know him. He sent me a note and actually drew me a, a hand sketch of a boat going down, which is, you know, this, this, he was called the master of disaster and he passed away. Um, I don't know why I smile when I say that, but I, I guess I'm so in awe of people who can take a moment in our history that maybe there are no survivors, there were no photographs, and they can recreate this. And when we look at the work, especially of Bob McGreevy, who's incredible, um, and especially uh, Pusick, it's just awesome that they can do that. This is the anchor of the Hetler, so it's a Bay City built, or yeah, Bay City built ship. It was called a Vale when it was launched here. It was crushed and carrying salt from Ludington, and this anchor is on the bottom. And the first time I saw this anchor, it was blue, and I went, "How did it last? Was it like the ice? Did it stay? How did this?" It turns out that somebody had stolen the anchor in the 1960s, brought it up and put it on their yard and painted it blue, and then, <laughs> and then some, we had a big time. You know, for many years people thought they could go and take anything they wanted off the bottom. And the truth is, it's all owned by the state. You have to get permits to do it. And so these guys were given an amnesty to give back these. And it's really hard to hide a ship anchor in your yard when it's that big. So thank heavens they gave it back and we put it down. But for the longest time, it was a bright blue. And now finally has kind of succumbed Lake Superior's cleaning it up. And we've got algae on it now. And this is actually through a glass bottom boat. If, how many people have taken the tour in in Munising. Oh, promise me, yeah. If you haven't done it, go up to Munising, take the glass bottom boat there. There's another fantastic glass bottom boat in Tobomori. You can see the sweepstakes. Um, there's another great one in Sheboygan that you can go and see the Leviathan. And they're great because you can go out there, you don't have to scuba dive or snorkel, and you can yeah, actually see a wreck before you. <laughs> um, 
out of curiosity, I don't know how familiar you are with like the Bay City area mm -hmm. like, nowadays, like over off of, it's off of Henry, like just north of Midland Street. Yep. There's that house with the big propeller in the yard. Is that identified? I I'm sure, has anybody know what it is? A big, anchor. We were just no big, yeah, big anchor. I, I know that many of the schooners that did lose anchors, and thank heavens, many times they were just an anchor that had been broken loose. In fact, the Edmund Fitzgerald, when it went through the Detroit River, lost its stern anchor, and sure enough, divers found it and brought it up, and now it's at the Dawson Museum. So anchors can, they're a little more interchangeable, but they don't write the names. Many times they'll put a date on it, though, for the bald anchor that they have there. We know that's from the Fitz, but from those anchors, it'd be a guess on any vessel that might be. But we can tell by the stock on the back if it came from a schooner or a steamer, or at least guess a year on there, which is, it kind of helps out there. But, um, this is Ludington today. This is Anchor Salt, what it looked like, not today, but uh, during World War II. So Anchor Salt built up, and they decided through the um, brine that was coming up, they could also pull manganese, which they needed for the processes, especially making uh, stainless steel and such. And so the government took the, pl the, the plant and then Dow Chemical bought into it. And so Dow built this up too. And this is the plant more probably towards the 60s and the 70s. And the well system is probably up in here. They don't use the well anymore in Ludington. It's all shipped down from Manistee where they had massive salt. Um, Morton had a big operation there until they moved everything to Louisiana. And now this whole plant is here, but they're piping it from Manistee. And thank heavens they do still make stuff here because we need it today. They make the Peladow product, which is the ice melt. So the majority of, of the you know, calcium, uh, calcium carbonate that comes up is coming out of that ocean that's down deep below us, 400 million years old. Um, at a time period when we were actually below the equator and through tectonics, Michigan moved all the way up here. Yeah? Um, I was digging in my dad's backyard. And I found you hit water? No. I didn't hit water. Oh, okay. But I did hit sand. Uh, I three feet pole enough, and I hit sand about a foot or a foot and a half down, and I found some mussels. And wow. Some so would the, and my dad and his coworker dated those to be several thousand years old. That's incredible. So would those be from the ocean or would be a separate? It could be, in which case they'd be 400 million years because you're talking the Devonian. If you're talking about real small shells all locked in limestone, you know, it's not a shell anymore. It's more of a fossil. That's what we see. All of our major operations for limestone, especially up in Alpena, Roger City, where we use it for make steel, all that stuff was that ocean. It was a coral reef of these soft corals and some critters that are in there. Uh, we don't have the cool trilobites around here, but if you go to New York, state uh, still on the Great Lakes but that has the big bugs and stuff we just mostly have and you can go to any lighthouse the uh, standard rock lighthouse the spectacle reef lighthouse are all built out of these uh, the limestone that came out of the um, uh, Sandusky area so those all have fossils in them you can go up and actually look at them when they're there yeah they're not like frozen in stone okay just separate yeah, like I dig into the sand and sometimes I find like a shell in the sand. That's cool. Yeah, it's probably just an older shell from you know, any of the freshwater clams that we have around here as well. When I was a kid growing up in the UP, I, we went out digging in the backyard and it was in our trailer park and uh, we hit water. It was the drain field that we hit. <laughs> Parents were not pleased. There was a big lawsuit. No, <laughs> thank heavens we just filled it back in, but we were all excited that we hit water and it was not the water you want to ever hit. So yeah, be careful where you dig. Um, so yeah, Peladow is the, the system that's being used now. Um, we're actually looking at utilizing this resource once again. Now we're 100 years past and now the this Wilkinson chemical is going to build on the other side. So here you see our Edson sitting right there, the Independence Bridge, and this big plant is going to come up here where the wells have been sunk, and they'll bring this up to actually pull chemicals out now again. So it's almost like we're revisiting again this resource that's underneath there. And the, the Salt River, too, is still there if you want to go kayaking with me. My hope is to go back and go and explore a little bit more. I thought for sure that I'd actually see it bubbling up from the bottom, but the sides are so high, and I don't know if that's because it's been bermed because of all the flooding. You know, there's many um, times that they would go through to try to tame the Titabawassee River, especially the Saginaw River, and they'd build up those banks, and that's probably what happened that I can't get to them anymore. My latest podcast has, it's so cool. I, I found all of WSGW's recordings. TV5 made a very nice deal with me uh, to get everything from Mike Avery, Eric Jyla, all their coverage, plus everything that wasn't on TV, 
all the old raw tapes. So I spent going through um, City Hall, actually is where they had the inquiry for the Jupiter. So the captain is talking about what happened when the ship exploded and it's never been seen or li listened to. So if you go to shipwreckpodcast.com, you can click into that. It's an hour telling stories. And the, the people actually going into the water um, in the rescue of them, the two gold medals were given to two local people. Do you remember the donut shops here in town? The um, Dunk, not Duncan, what was it? Uh, Dunk. Dawn Donuts, the Colby family that had that, Colby Cleaners too. Um, incredible heroes. Um, amazing that uh, Gene spent time with me, Bob has passed away, he both got medals for saving lives. I also got uh, a great interview with the Coast Guardsman whose job was to go out to the boat when it broke loose and went into the river. He had to put a rope around the <laughs> anchor. And to hear that story from, from him, Cormier, Paul Cormier, it's, it's great. So check it out for free online at Shipper podcast my hope is to make a couple more this year but the Jupiter's always been a tough one for me because I had to do all that archive chasing and thank heavens now with the uh, cold winters it's a little easier to sit down and do that I also lost my whole hunting season I don't know how that happened this year but any questions at all yes where did you say the salt spring was that Holton was and it's very specific too if you go up the river and if you know where the dam is at Sanford Yep, Titabawasi up um, the dam, and then you come back, and it's literally where the Salt River comes in, which is a little bridge that goes across. There's a little school that sits on top in the woods. It's all, it's a, it's a ghost school now. I mean, it's like probably 100 years old. And you go um, into the, the, the river system. If you come back from the Salt, go upstream, um, no, I'd be downstream, forgive me, downstream, about 40 rods is what they say, and that's right where the park system is. Now, I dropped my kayak in there. It's a hill like this, and if you notice how I was sitting in the uh, kayak with my knees up like that, I was wearing my dress pants like an idiot. I was going to a lecture, and I thought, this will be easy. I'll go to the park, and, but all the parks, because of the dam breaking loose, are all shut down, so easy access is not there, but you can take a dirt road that goes through the town of of Sanford and a short distance goes to a giant hill like this and it was all mud. So I showed up at my lecture with uh, clay, clay on my shoes and everybody's like, what? I said, hey, it's all part of the process, trust me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what's the biggest shipwreck you've ever found or explored? Hmm. The Edmund Fitzgerald is the biggest that was ever lost on the Great Lakes, and I saw that in 94 in a submarine. So I went down 500 feet and went all the way around the bow section twice, and then went in and got lost for a half hour underwater, and then managed to get to the stern section and got up, looked at the back of the ship, got lost again, and we finally had to come back. So yeah, I was lost most of the time, but I did get to see that one. Mm -hmm. You got lost, like how careless, like what were your thoughts? You know, you, you know that you're sealed in a tube, so you're relatively safe, and you can always just, you know, purge and go up. So, but I wanted to stay down because, you know, the clock's ticking. We had five other people that needed to take a trip. Tom Knob, who worked at TV5 with me, was our photographer. He needed to come down and do a trip, too. Um, so I needed to come back up. But with our compass would just do this. So they'd say, go 180 degrees and go this way. And our compass is just going because all the metal and all the steel and the, the taconite is everywhere. So we would just go like this and all of a sudden they go where are you at I said I'm on hatch number two and three and they go you're on the bow and like no 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 and then all of a sudden you saw the upside down stern those hatches had blown off and they were in the back so that's why we were totally confused in my book uh, which is at the gift shop uh, Tattletale Sounds the entire um, crazy hour and 45 minutes of me being on the bottom is added into not only that but what 40 interviews that I've done with people that built it sailed it and also dove it Jacques Cousteau's son it was interviewed that I interviewed for the book too so neat stuff any other yeah yeah I'm confused about the salt because then oh they had the, the salt like in Bay City, mm -hmm. City uh, Saginaw in uh, Midland how in the middle, I understand, because the water is not faulty, so how do, how do they make it? Sure, in fact, I should have gone in, when I do my lighthouse lecture and I talk about the reefs, 400 million years ago during the Devonian period, all of Michigan, all of the North America was below the equator. So through tectonic plate shifting, all most of the land on our planet 400 million years ago was all below the equator. So this was all a shallow ocean. So here we had probably, 
It was probably 300 feet deep or so is what they're guessing. All of that salt through millions of years accumulated into a thickness and all of the coral reefs turned into um, uh, limestone that we use now today. So that belt of limestone, that coral reef goes all the way up from Alpena all the way into Upper Michigan where we harvested out of um, Cedarville, Michigan, even all the way into the center of the Upper Peninsula as well. So all this ocean 400 million years ago slowly shifted above the equator broke into pieces to become North and South America with our Central America in the center. And we came above to where now there is no salt water or warm enough temperatures for sea life. That's why those critters that we find on the bottom are very much ocean animals, but they weren't part of you know where we actually live today. They'd never survive, obviously, the winters that we have. I barely survive our winters that we have today. Does that make sense? Why it's salt water? So uh, trapped underneath the under the ground, that whole area that goes from here to West Virginia. Underneath? Yeah, all of it. It's a, a 800 to 1,000 feet, and then there's... How far down? 800 feet down. Okay. Yep, and then there's areas where the earth is cracked, where it's percolating up. So we'll actually get these springs that'll bubble up, and that's why the animals were coming up and eating it. That's why the river is called Salt River, because it, it technically, I didn't taste it. It didn't look like I should take a drink of that <laughs> by any means. So so that river is called Salt River, and we see several areas where, you know, the, the town in um, South Saginaw was called Salina. And there was also a Salina, New York, which is right next, and that's because that whole lake has a crust from the marsh area there where that's percolating up. And now that's uh, actually a mall that's there in Syracuse where all that area right across the highway, you know, nobody wants to canoe in it or do it because it's, you know, it's, it's brinish, it's brackish, what we call um, no real life that'll live there except for maybe some plants. But then the rest of the lake is pretty they, clean. They, salt here? No. They, they used to. They stopped it once we lost our, our free source of, of wood. That went away and it dried up our, our resource. It didn't make sense now. When we had, we tried to get coal out of St. Charles and some of the coal mines, it, our coal wasn't good quality here at all. I mean, not compared to what you could get out of Pennsylvania. So we lost that market. Manistee kept it. We saw Anchor. Yep, yep, well, it's all in Ludington now is kind of where that plant is. Dow turned over to another company. I can't remember the name now. They just sold out not too long ago, but they still sell that ice melt that we use. Detroit has underground that they scrape out salt. That's all used for roads. That's all, you know, we don't use it to pack fish the way they used to or salt, table salt. Um, uh, big operation in Goderich, scraping underground, deep underground, scraping it out instead of taking the water resource out. They're scraping the salt and actually shipping that. And we still do that by boat. We still get big freighters that do it, but it's miserable on the boats. Okay, yeah. Most of the salt now is used to produce chlorine. Mm -hmm. What was the salt used that was originally mined? Originally, it was fantastic for packing fish. That's what they really thought would be great because they could, it opened that resource that once we put in the Sulox in 1855, all that white fish was coming down. That was a big use of our salt. They used a ton of it too for table salt, you know, because the quality was so good. Baking salt, if you were at the level of baking salt, that was like primo and Saginaw Bay City salt was there. So that's a lot of it too, but now all of it's all used on the roads and uh, melting. Yeah. Can you explain Dow Chemicals connection with salt mines? Well, partly, partly because I haven't done enough research on, on Henry Dow, but uh, he went, came in, realized that that bromine was down there and put his own wells in, brought it up, and much of that stuff was turned into um, chloride you know, the use, so they would make bleaches and stuff out of that. Um, he had all kinds of uses that were being used. There's even a salt block museum that you can go and see. I don't know the condition after the big flood when the Sanford Dam ruptured. They had some damage at the museum and it's been closed for a while I think it's back open and that would be you know me I'm gonna pitch the museums the best place to learn about these things are the museums and, and the best way to learn about that and to see what the operation is is to see exactly the block that they have set up there over by the college um, so it's right next to Northwood Northwood University is where that museum is so please check that out and, and there's a couple books on it too as well if you had a ship that sank I'd know more about that <laughs> The Jupiter actually worked out of that, out of Ludington too. It actually um, came in there, so there is a connection there as well. The first trip of the year. One more, yep. Yeah. Um, have you ever uh, 
explored any military ships? A couple. Um, a Coast Guard vessels, the, the Mesquite, sank in uh, Lake Superior, and I've been down to see that. It's about 130 feet down. Um, I dove the, the Coast Guard cutter Duane. I dove the Hollyhock in the ocean, where it was built here in Bay City and launched in 34 and served on the lakes. And then they brought it down to Miami, and they said, we're done with it. So they sank it for the fish to live in it, so they had a place to fish. And so I went down there and got to see a ship built in Bay City at Fort Lauderdale. So military ships there. I dove, um, there's a couple of destroyer escorts too that, that have sunk, none that came from this area unfortunately, but um, more dives. And uh, the, 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 big, um, the big destroyers that were built here for the Australian Navy are actually in Australia. And so I'm saving my pop cans right now because all three of those, the Perth, the Melbourne, the Brisbane are all there. One of them, the Perth actually has his gun still on his deck. So they sank them down for divers to visit, built in Bay City by probably some of you in the audience. Uh, I know one picture of the launch of the, the I think the Brisbane shows Mel Cerro in a basket from TV um, young Mel Cerro swinging back and forth and I've, I've got to get the footage out for him because they're, they're doing a big 75th anniversary. Um, they just called me in so in February you'll see I'll do an interview talking about the, the Fitzgerald and the Jupiter and a couple other things and of course reminiscing about uh, Brian and uh, the guys, an uh, incredible team we've worked with who've passed too. Thank you for being my first talk. This is so great. I'm thrilled to be back in it. We'll see you later.